we're just waiting a couple of more minutes for some more folks to join and then we'll we'll get started soon Okay, folks, I think, I think we'll get started. Uh, thank, thank you so much for joining in and welcome. Welcome to the fifth edition of the Uday Knowledge Sessions brought to you by Mumbai FinTech Hub and PwC. Um, I know we've got a lot of folks who've been coming for a lot of our sessions, but for those of you who are new to this, um, just a quick introduction to what Mumbai FinTech Hub does and what the Uday Sessions are about. Uh, so the Mumbai FinTech Hub is the FinTech vertical of the government of Maharashtra uh, and is focused on the growth of the FinTech sector in the state as well as uh, for the country as well, with a key focus on building fintech talent through education. Uh, so Uday is the flagship uh, fintech education program of the Mumbai Fintech Hub. Uday focuses on assisting students like yourselves who have uh, joined and who are interested in pursuing careers in the fintech space by uh, equipping you with relevant knowledge, giving you access to information that you need to explore such careers. And that's the whole philosophy behind the Uday knowledge sessions where we've, we've set up this one hour session every week where we specifically focus on providing you with uh, fintech knowledge related to the basics of different models and, and concepts by inviting industry experts and industry players to provide their perspective and give you uh, their take on how that how that space works uh, today we are very excited to in invite nitin parak from simple uh, simple as some of you know uh, has carved out a niche for itself in the pay later space um, and in fact, it's a, it's a fitting representation of what fintech models in general aim to do uh, in terms of a providing strong customer experience using say a, a combination of innovative offerings, digital technologies, um, and at the point of that customer experience, providing seamless access to financial services. Uh, so really looking forward to to Nitin's session today on the pay later space. A bit about Nitin. Nitin is the vice president at Simple, managing the pay later business. Uh, he has 10, more than 10 years of ex, uh, experience in corporate finance, investment banking, and private equity venture capital, investing in the financial services space. Uh, today, he's going to focus on uh, the pay later model, how simple goes about doing that, what, what are the, the nuances around the model, um, and, and then go into other aspects. We've got a lot of questions from you guys that we'll also cover. Uh, so we're really excited to have you and, and welcome Nitin uh, today. Um, as, as with the previous sessions, uh, and we've always wanted this to be interactive, uh, so this session is also designed in that fashion. So one is, of course, uh, a lot of you have sent in your questions at the time of registration, and Nitin has already taken that into account, and some of his slides will also cover those, those answers. Uh, but we also uh, invite you to ask your questions using the Q&A feature in the WebEx uh, space. So if you look at your screens right now, it, it shows you how you can access the Q&A feature. So if you're using accessing WebEx from your laptop, then you can click on the, the black button with the three dots. Uh, it'll open up an option to click on the Q&A panel. Uh, once you click on the Q&A panel, you'll be given an option to choose all panelists. Um, and then you can type in your question in the chat screen so that we can get access to your, your questions and then pass those on to Nathan. Uh, if you're using the, your mobile phone, it's a very similar flow. Again, choose the, the black button with the three dots, uh, click on Q&A, choose all panelists, and then type in your questions and send it to us, and we'll send it across to you. Uh, so that's it. And Without any further ado, over to you, Nathan. Uh, welcome and, and looking forward to your session. Thanks, Anish. Thanks, Anish. Uh, thanks, guys, for joining in. All right. 
Hi everyone. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you loud. Okay. So, so I, I think uh, thanks, thanks guys for having me on this Uday knowledge session. And it's it's a great opportunity for young people to learn about pay later business, understand more about financial services and how how fintech companies try to change the system and and build an ecosystem around a lot of these payment methods, right? And today we're going to specifically focus about pay later business and and the reason why pay later exists today, how we actually model this business out, and how are we really working uh, with merchants with networks. Uh, with with regulators to uh, to basically have the next evolution in mobile commerce, right? Which is why my first slide basically says that Paylater is nothing but enabling frictionless commerce, which is mobile first. Okay, so let's try and understand first what the market looks like. Uh, so as you know, in e-commerce in India, and when I when I talk about payments, I typically want to focus on commerce payments. Uh, P2P transactions really don't account for major of uh, the commerce and usually do not carry a fee or, or a data back for that money, right? So if you talk about Indian e-commerce payments, it's mainly fragmented into different modes of payment. Okay, if you look on the right-hand side of the uh, pie chart, 92% of payments are debit-based and only about 8% of the payments are credit-based, right? When you're making a payment decision, right, your your payment can either be a credit based payments or a debit based payment. debit based payment means basically money going from your bank account or a wallet where you've loaded money using your bank account. Right. So one thing which is very clear in India is there's no one fragmented, uh, there's no clear leader in the market and it's a very fragmented market for a large uh, e commerce play, which is happening in India. Right. Uh, and given that there are a lot many options like your debit card, uh, UPI, wallets, Paytm, free charge, and then pay later models, your credit cards, also prepaid cards. Uh, it's very, it's very fragmented, but at the same time, people still in India and tend to choose cash over all these digital payment methods. Uh, so let me, let me walk you through first, how, uh, typically, uh, the market looks like in India. And then, then let's understand what the consumer really wants and is hoping for, and then eventually go to the merchant and understand what are their needs, and then we can discuss the pay later model in detail. Okay. Okay. So, in terms of credit based payments in India, right? Uh, we have about only twenty five million unique consumers in India who have a credit card. And when I talk about credit based payments, I'm talking about convenience credit based payments, not payments based for affordability. Uh, do not confuse yourself with pay later business model as a model which is towards your installments or or lending per se, right? And and this is where the key part happens, right? There's a high concentration of credit cards in a certain set of people, and usually you would have seen that people who have credit cards do not usually carry one or two credit cards. They usually have more than more than two, or or even the banks or these policy bazaar, bank bazaar are trying to give credit cards to the people who already have them, right? This is traditionally because of the ineffective ways of how credit card underwriting is done. And usually to get to be in the credit card or, or be in the credit ec economy uh, sort of for payments, the first the first leg is difficult. And once you have that, then it's much easier for banks to uh, overlay on what the other banks would have done. Uh, and, and now the consumers uh, are also shifting from credit based payments to more towards debit based payments because uh, there's a lot of digitization happened on especially uh, UPI wallets and much of these things, right? Uh, so let me let me cover what the market looks like in India. Uh, so so the market in India is one we discussed. The payment market is fragmented, but there's a huge influx of bank accounts uh, and identity management, right? So we have about one million KYC consumers in India, and that's mainly because of the Aadhaar initiative and much of these things. And typically, most of these users have been given savings bank account, which is why you have about 900 million accounts in India. And usually in India, uh, most of these bank accounts come with a debit card. Okay. Uh, because this might be because of the push from the government, uh, which is more towards the Jandan Yojana subsidy schemes coming into your account. Right. And there are a lot of push coming from the government, especially with demonetization and other government policies trying to make MDRs zero for debit cards, wherein uh, commerce and payments can flow without any uh, hurdle in terms of the marketing rate. Right. Uh, today, 
uh, digital payments especially account for about one fourth of 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 the entire uh, commerce payment happening in India. When I talk about commerce, I'm typically talking about e-commerce, right? And, and the banking platform itself is moving very swiftly towards uh, mobile first. And the reason why they they feel that that would be the right right persona for Indian consumers is because we never got a chance to actually use internet banking for a very long time. So the infrastructure quickly moved away from desktop based uh, infrastructure to a mobile first consumer uh, e-commerce or, or payments mechanism, right? So the entire infrastructure is very quickly moving to be mobile first. And at the same time, they want it to be cashless. Okay. So, so that's pretty much how the market looks like. And then let me go back to the previous slide. Given that there are about 900 million debit cards or bank accounts in India, there are only about 25 million unique consumers who have a credit card. So you, you see the, the, the disparity between the people who have credit-based payments or have the chance to even have a credit-based payment mechanism versus a debit is huge. So there's a very, uh, very high concentration on the people who actually have them. And there's a very low penetration of credit card industry in India. Uh, there, there are quite a few reasons for it. Uh, as I said earlier, that uh, the credit bureaus are not very efficient. Users are affluent towards not having high interest uh, bearing credit cards in India, right? And the way I would want you to think is typically, uh, think about this, right? A millennial consumer is gonna be the same person who's in India uh, compared to a person who's living in the US. He's gonna listen to the same music on Spotify, which you guys are listening to in India. He would be also wanting to buy similar set of clothes or either your fashion, your taste of music, your, your taste of fashion, your taste of travel is pretty much aligned. So a millennial consumer usually does not want to differentiate themselves. They're pretty much on the same and they want the best experience at the same time, extremely affordable, right? Uh, and these are the people who would be the next uh, empowerment or these are the people who basically empower the next economic change in India. Uh, so, so this is about the market. Now, what do consumers really want and why do they prefer cash on delivery, right? And as you saw that cash on delivery is one of the most preferred payment methods, especially in India. And, and this is pretty much the story in most of these emerging markets uh, is because you would not want to pay uh, traditionally unless you have received those goods and services, right? Uh, and, and you want that, that last call to be made by yourself once you are satisfied about the services happening. Uh, the government is trying to solve this with a lot of initiatives. But at the same time, uh, moving to bank accounts or wallets or UPI has still not solved it because there are multiple layers of uh, touch points where the consumer has to actually move his money. So if you think about this, right, uh, the biggest change which happened during the wallets and demonetization time was people were moving their money from their bank account to wallets and then eventually transact from the wallets. What they were actually trying to solve for is a divergence between two-factor authentication. Right. So, so anywhere you find there's an arbitrage, which can be solved with a better user experience and a one time pain uh, is considered to be a, a way better consumer experience than handling cash. Uh, then the next wave came after wallets was UPI. What, what, what we were, they were able to figure out that why do we need even wallets, right? We don't have to load our money. Can we do small ticket, high frequency transactions using our bank account itself, which is why the UPI rails were built and the transactions used to flow uh, very quickly. But, but what is happening right now is because of, because of the extreme traffic on UPI rails and infrastructure being built by government and managed by them, right? There are massive amount of payment failures. And whenever there are massive amount of payment failures, especially on mobile, you tend to drop that transaction. Now, the person who's actually losing the most out of this is gonna be your merchant, right? And you would have basically seen when you use cash and delivery, your order usually does not fail because of the payment method, right? Uh, so which is where Simple comes in and a lot of other players like Simple help bridge that gap. And at the same time, you, you can get away with the uh, multiple factors of authentication. Uh, you also help the merchant uh, build trust with the consumers. There's, no, there's going to be no fraudulent activity happening from your bank account. And the biggest biggest change there is the between credit based payments and debit based payments is uh, the fear of fraud, right, or chargebacks per se. 
if you have done a transaction using your bank account, it's your money which has actually gone out and you are the person who will be liable or you're the person who has to actually go out and fight for your own money and figure it out with the merchant or the ultimate vendor. When it comes to uh, a credit-based payment, right, the intermediary can be, a, let's say, an Amex card who, who gives you the best customer service uh, is going to go after the merchant, try and understand what really happened in the transaction and, and come up with the best service for you uh, given the transaction happened in a chargeback scenario, right? So, so this, is what, this is why consumers really prefer cash on delivery. Uh, and historically, Indians have had the habit of using uh, cash, right? And this was solved by Flipkart very early on when the penetration of digital payments or card-based payments was not very high. Uh, but at the same time, uh, cash has not the best user experience. Handling of cash for the merchants become a problem. Handling of cash for a consumer also becomes a problem in the later stages of life, right? So the, the entire idea of figuring out the best user experience where you, for the customer would be uh, a credit-based payment, which acts as a debit-based payment, where you're basically running a tab with that similar merchant, right? That unless the goods and services delivered to you were not up to your expectation, you will not pay it, okay? So you get all the benefits of cash without even spending your own cash. At the same time, you get all the benefits of credit uh, without even having to take take a lending line or a, or a, or a credit card, which will charge you high rates of interest or taking a, a consumer loan. And typically, uh, consumers would want this sort of a service for non-discretionary purchases. You wouldn't want to do uh, cash and delivery for, for basically, let's say, high ticket purchases like uh, you're, you're buying your car or a house or, or your vehicles, right? So which is why where we focus on is high frequency transactions, lowest ticket sizes, which are daily use cases, weekly use cases, or once in a week or once in a month use cases. Right. So let me let me talk about what consumers have been doing so far. Okay, what they really want. So to my next slide is there is a behavioral change which has not happened in India. Right. Imagine a scenario wherein let's say you live in Bombay, right, and you basically have a neighborhood Kirana store with whom you transact on a daily basis. You're buying cigarettes from him. You're buying eggs. You're buying milk from him. And he knows you, he knows you by, so he has built an identity that nothing comes over to my store every day morning. He buys these five things, okay? Uh, he pays them up front. Uh, but at the same time, what the storekeeper is also trying to do is trying to understand your spend pattern. And also at times what they do is give you sort of a kata. You basically have this transaction going with him that basically you're gonna say, uh, uh, I bought these five things. Can you write it in my kata? Okay, and I will settle it once a week. Right? What the merchant really is doing is he has built the trust with you by seeing your transactional behavior. He knows where you live, right? He knows what you look like. He also knows your spending pattern. So he must, he's more comfortable giving you that short-term credit, which is not going to smoothen your credit curve per se, but at the same time, he's going to make that checkout convenience or checkout experience way better, right? Imagine this, you go to a store, pick up whatever you want, and just leave and tell the shopkeeper that, hey, can you write in my tab, right? So, so that's the best use case which can happen to you near your neighborhood council. We wanted to bring that experience to, to the consumers in the digital world, right? And the only way you can build that sort of an experience is you build a two-sided marketplace between the merchant and the consumer where you have the highest trust and the loyalty is not towards a credit card company or a wallet, it's more towards that specific merchant. Right, and we would we typically call that uh, a, a typical kata or a house account, which is run by a neighborhood kirana store, is a de facto credit card for India because he does all the entire he does the entire underwriting for you, he does risk management, he builds trust with you, you build loyalty with him, and that's how the whole cycle runs. So this is a two sided marketplace, very difficult to build, but at the same time, once you've built the trust and you have that affinity towards that specific merchant, that's when the best UI experience. For you really occurs and that's why consumers really love doing transactions with some of the other people right and that's why your retention and a bunch of those things keep increasing with that specific merchant uh so let me now let me do this let me talk about what we really offer okay and why do we offer a certain product which is very different than lending but but similar to uh the neighborhood kirana khata which i mentioned to you about right so what you're trying to build is basically a tab 
for every merchant you have transacted with or want to transact with okay and that is basically the way you could build a tab for different merchant is give you the best user experience in terms of like a one click checkout in the initial way but at the same time consolidate all your bills across different tabs into one bill and eventually you 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 pay for it right uh, and again right paying for one bill across all the purchases is 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 definitely a, a go checkout experience but at the same time this can only be solved if you start with credit first uh, and and the way we actually go after this is think of think of something like this as like a charge card from amex wherein amex would underwrite you uh, know your trust score know your your data a bunch of your ability to pay your intent to pay and those scores but at the same time they would not be able to gauge where do you have your affinity most and especially how many high frequency transactions you do and and the biggest problem with with majority of these car cards which they face in india is the penetration which we spoke about earlier but at the same time also the mdr rates they charge are very high for these merchants right so imagine in a typical uh, a card there are a transaction happening between a merchant and a consumer there are three parties involved so imagine if you have a, a visa issued hdfc card uh, that will basically be uh, a network of visa right and if hdfc is going to be the underwriter who's going to be taking the underwriting risk but eventually your affinity or your loyalty goes towards hdfc now who's paying for it the merchant is paying for it is he building trust with you no is he going to have your loyalty towards the merchant that's not going to happen because there is a card in between against which you are uh, earning those loyalty points and they they put you in that game right so what we want to really come up with is bend that entire value chain and bring the merchant and the consumer closer the only way you could do that is basically try and have a lot of data exchange between the merchant and the consumer and the data exchange can not only happen between the transactions which are being done with that specific merchant also what's happening let's say what nitin does with zomato compared to what nitin does at swiggy uh, what he does at bounce rapido bunch of those places right so if you merge all those different data points together and then try and understand his behavior across all those platforms and th that's when you can actually build a real trust uh, there's a very good saying that people keep saying that data is oil right but only data which is backed by money is the real oil because you've actually made a purchasing decision and you've paid for it and that's the data which really helps you uh, that, that that is something which which we try and understand with the merchants help them figure out like let's say within usually orders healthy food what are the other healthy companies or healthy startups or or any uh, e-commerce companies who are trying to promote healthy products can we target Nitin for that? Is Nitin the right consumer cohort for those special products, right? And whenever merchants want to launch new products, they would want to focus on that per that person. Uh, so what we did is rather than having a card experience, we built a mobile first and digital only charge card, okay? With credit as a convenience factor, not as an affordability factor, okay? That's what, that's what uh, in one line uh, is what we do. And what we really believe uh, on is we feel that the best payments experience has to be no experience you you do not go to zomato to have uh, to actually go and make a payment you go to zomato to buy food you want to get done with it as soon as possible right and payment comes to the extreme end but at the same time it's the most time consuming process for a usual customer that's the feedback we've got from a lot of merchants and that's where merchants face these problems okay what merchants see is usually the consumers drop off very early when they're trying to make a purchasing decision, especially when I talk about purchasing decisions, these are high frequency uh, transactions, especially like food, uh, grocery, uh, your Uber rides, Ola rides, or your Meru rides, or, or your bounce and bunch of those things, right? What they see is, is the failure rates drastically change when you have a pay later method. The reason because is, you were not making the, so every click you do on a merchant leads to a decision right and if there is a problem in between those clicks there might be a technical glitch on upi servers there might be a technical glitch uh, at your card transaction or a payment gateway that's when you your decision would change from one merchant to another now i'll give you a very simple example of let's say swiggy and zomato right uh, 
you you would typically find both of these companies trying to build the same product a homogeneous set of restaurants where you typically order from uh, and if you lose a transaction or if you're not able to go through a transaction on Zomato, you quickly want to switch to Swiggy and complete the transaction if it's going to happen there. Th this is something which which they are very wary of because they don't want to lose that customer for even the next five minutes or ten minutes. Uh, and what what merchants usually see is that sort of payment success rate helps them drive through transactions more frequently uh, and at the same time increase their order frequency, right? And and what we have done very specifically is we built a two side network with merchants and with consumers. At the same time, we have the fastest or the quickest checkout experience, similar to what Visa has built. Uh, we do a transaction in less than ten milliseconds, uh, which is quite commendable given that wallets. Uh, have to write uh, into your ledger, uh, query into your ledger to check your balance because this is a convenience. There's a direct interaction between the merchant and simple. The consumer never plays a part between that payment mechanism, right? So, and also what it does is because the transactions flow more quickly and frequencies increase, the merchants are able to make more money at the same time sell you more products and services. Uh, okay. Now let's understand what are the key five parts or the main five parts which help us build pay later for scale and what is the critical infrastructure you need to have to really understand this market. So there are a lot of facets to this. Understand at the same time underwrite and you also have to actually enable merchants to be able to do this. Okay. So the first one, uh, you need to build a very large merchant network. If you're only available on, let's say, one or two merchants, a user will not find value in your pay later system, right? Uh, to give you a very quick example uh, would be Visa, Visa or MasterCard. The main consumers are going to be banks through which they distribute their cards. But at the same time, their payment trails would eventually be have to be accepted by each and every vendor uh, in comparison to the banks, right? Banks will not build the infrastructure for them for the rails to actually go through, uh, which is why they have deep integrations with payment providers like MSwipe, uh, Buildesk, Razorpay, and a bunch of these guys. The, the idea of having a large set of merchant apps or, or merchant integrations would basically be that if you do it with one or two merchants, but at the same time, if I'm able to solve the similar problem and open a tab for you with 100 or 200 or other merchants, across the entire ecosystem where you usually transact with, that's when you'll find the real value in payments. Uh, the payments are being solved from a consumer point of view, but at the same time, it's more towards a merchant centric. The merchant needs it uh, on a very, on, a, on, the, on the best customers because they want to provide the best user experience as well. Uh, so this becomes a very bigger role for us. The second part would be, how do you underwrite these users and how do you build those fraud models while you are, uh, trying to go broaden your merchant network, right? The only way this can be done is have a wide variety of merchants, okay? Uh, because your consumer behavior might be very different when you're buying food to when you're buying, let's say, uh, your, your basically your, your fashion or, or your clothing on Mintra or Jabong, right? So your decision-making changes across different times, but every time you build a trust with a merchant and you're also backing the trust with some money. Uh, I'll give you a quick example and not name the merchant, but what we have seen, especially in uh, in women in the age bracket of 18 to 25, is typically during uh, their birthdays, right? Uh, they would usually shop at three different places, order clothes from three different places, and have a one week delivery system, one week return delivery, right? Now, these three different merchants really do not know what's happening. They are thinking that the consumer really wants to purchase all the orders she has put in. But at the same time, what the consumer is trying to do is get these products at home, try and see uh, which one looks best on me. At the same time, uh, eventually uh, also not pay for the products she has used, right? Uh, now, what is what is uh, what is this doing to the merchant? It's costing them a lot of money, especially uh, with delivery, uh, especially with serving that customer, and then the return order of these goods, right? Now, if uh, if the merchant not only uh, has the delivery mechanism or the history or insights on those set of consumers, what they have done within themselves, but also has the data on what that certain customer has done with five peer uh, competitors, right? Then he would be able to decide better, 
right? So what we do is we act as a data cooperative for these merchants. When the merchants openly share the data of transactions happening with them, what we do is then we give pay data product to these consumers and try and understand that spend pattern, usage behavior, and run data analytics models on them and see where do they stand in terms of that trust score and how their social graph looks and how their purchasing power has changed and what do they usually shop for. Uh, I'll give a, a typical example, right? Uh, typically when frauds happen, there are different types of frauds. Uh, there would be a, a coupon fraud, somebody who's habituated to using coupons for doing frauds. When merchants want to call it as fraud, typically these are discounts given to you and your coupon driven purchases usually are very expensive for the merchants, right? But the merchants have to keep doing them because they want to acquire the best customers. And typically what we've seen is the best customers usually do not use coupons. What they want is the best user experience. At the same time, they want to get the best service possible uh, from that merchant. Uh, so we help in what, so the merchants help us in feeding to the underwriting model, okay? We help them improve their fraud models Okay, and this continuous loop helps us in getting more consumers at the same time define demographics of, of the consumers which exist in our society today and then offer specific pay later products only to those people who need our underwriting and for model criteria right. And and typically we, we try and compare ourselves uh, with the bureau data and the way we say is basically that a thin file data when you're not trying to judge or underwrite a consumer based on his ability to pay, you're trying to underwrite a consumer more on his intent to pay, right? And it, the, those two things are very different. The reason why I say intent versus ability, you can derive ability depending upon your spend pattern, right? If, if Nitin is going to Flipkart and buying, buying an iPhone, he's then buying an AirPod, and then suddenly he goes to Zomato and basically orders Italy every day, right? Uh, so those, those, those sort of patterns really help us in underwriting users at the same time also help us talk to the merchants and give them those analytics wherein they can serve these consumers better by helping them gain premium products. Uh, let me, let me take you through another one. Why we need this and, and how a consumer facing app really helps us in underwriting the user better. So as I said, we get transactional data from not one merchant but a lot of different merchants, uh, which helps us act as a data cooperative and eventually help them serve better by giving them trust score uh, and also help them in underwriting uh, or building fraud models for themselves, right? Uh, the reason why we want to go with the consumer facing app is also act as a platform where the users can budget towards their bills, see what they have spent in a month, where they have spent, and these also act as uh, additional data inputs where the users can share uh, more data and try and figure out if they fit into a better credit model internally for us. Uh, but at the same time, what we really want to do uh, here is one, be able to provide that experience. At the same time, if there are any issues with a specific order, what you could do is you can basically go to that line item and hit for a chargeback and you never have to worry about the transaction being a uh, credit to your account. I'll give an example. Typically, when you let's say when you do a transaction using your credit card, and let's say you ordered on Big Basket, your your order was for two thousand rupees, and let's say five out of the twenty items were not up to the quality mark, and you want to return them, you would go to the customer feedback. Uh, you would give them the feedback. You would say that I want to return these five goods. Uh, Big Basket would do that in like a day or two, and then they would credit that money into your wallet, right? So they are putting you in a loop where you would have to use that money sometime or other, right? What Simple does is because you have not paid that money from your account to the merchant, and we usually pay to the merchant, uh, depends on the kind of merchant, it's usually T plus two or T plus seven from the transaction date, right? We hold back the money unless you, are full, you have fulfilled uh, or you have given us the go ahead for these transactions. And then credit, instantly credit your account for which you have actually not paid. So this solves for that end mile experience or the biggest hassle which you face with your debit cards or credit card. Uh, and and the, the simple app acts as a tool for you to access that. At the same time, what we're also trying to come up with is give you niche products, okay? Or help you serve your credit needs better. So the idea is once we have solved for your convenience credit or daily payment use cases, 
that's when we want to go after your affordable key use cases depending on your pattern and that's how most pay later companies want to build uh, their credit underwriting models because going after bureau data is going to be very different because a bank can lend that kind of money to a user and eventually uh, a, a large pool of users would be there and if they're not served properly that's when that's when they default and then the consumers drop off right so strengthening the consumer's profile by getting more data from the consumer himself is good but at the same time if this tool can act as an expense management at the same time can be the only consumer facing app you don't want to go to vodafone and claim a chargeback on it or go to zomato dunzo a bunch of those places you can do all of those things at one one spot that that's the idea of having consumer facing app then this is the most important part wherein i want to spend more time um so okay so we spoke about fraud models we spoke about underwriting models and we spoke about different people sharing their data into our underwriting models now the way we imagine this is going to be like a centralized ledger which is an up and up only permission ledger wherein you have different parties uh, you have different merchants you have different lenders you have different reward companies there can be banks in it and there can be different consumers in it right uh, and the three main pillars which actually help us define the system of intelligence which is towards one towards underwriting and authenticating which is basically identity management trying to understand whether uh Nathan, the way he's portraying himself is it the same Nathan who has actually signed up for this okay and then also what the merchant wants is try and see if the consumer is engaged with the merchant and how far has he gone on that engagement journey right uh, so the way we, we do it is i'll give an example here that let's say lender one can give a customer credit line of thousand rupees right uh, that's typically a bank or an nbfc or any financial institution right and when when a line is given to a user he can spend that line on on a closed network loop of let's say 100 merchants okay now these merchants debit into the ledger wherein they take money from the lender and the money goes to the merchant now what is it helping uh, the lender do the lender really understands that the money is spent for certain use cases and builds his model accordingly uh, at the same time the merchant a rather than giving rewards to the lender typically a credit card or something he can give rewards directly to the consumer that's where the loyalty happens uh, uh, that's when the rewards actually kick in for the consumer where the consumer gets the direct benefit from the merchant now if you if you are able to build this sort of a three-party ledger with one merchant on one side at the same time lenders you can have banks on the other side that's where the true system of intelligence really comes in you you clearly can define a consumer his purchasing behavior, his trust with different merchants. Uh, I give an example. Uh, a lot of people order food on Zomato, okay, and these sort of people also uh, take bounce bikes for a ride. Uh, whenever these, they they portray a very different behavior on Zomato when compared to on Bounce. On Bounce, they behave very unruly, even though. Bounds would have done a typical underwriting. They would have taken your driving license. They would have taken your address proof and a bunch of those things. But at the same time, these set of users are eventually ending up misusing their bikes because they know for a small ticket transaction, the asset cost is heavy for the merchant. That's where the merchant would really want to see if somebody else can provide them a trust that, hey, Nathan uh, stands 0.9 on the trust score between one to 10. I think he's good to go. Uh, if you can give him credit, Right. If you can directly write a tab on your name, uh, Nathan is good for X amount of money. Right. Now, what the merchant can really do is engage more on Nathan rather than engaging on a uh, rest hundred people and then trying to basically wait out for the next couple of months to understand who behaves in the most easiest fashion. Right. So this three-party ledger basically acts as a core to our entire business model, and I think Simple is the only company. Who has actually built a three-party ledger in India? Uh, most other pay later companies, I think you would have heard of uh, Paytm, uh, Daisy Pay, Ola Money, Postpaid, EPay Later. Uh, they don't act as a data cooperative. What they do is basically source your data from different transactions or P2P transactions, what you would have made along with P2M, and then underwrite you basis on that. Now, that may not be the true way of actually underwriting. It should be more towards enabling merchants 
to directly talk to their consumers. And one of the key, key factors of being a pay later on a network business is being absolutely neutral, right? Um, I think you would have seen this, uh, Flipkart does not work with uh, Paytm, Amazon does not work with Paytm, uh, and you would have also heard that uh, Paytm was working with Bookmation for a very long time, and that's when Paytm really got the data and the information, and then they built their own uh, mobile ticketing platform, right? Uh, so the merchants want us to be extremely neutral, uh, be transparent to them in terms of what are we doing with their data, at the same time help them more with the industry-wide data. So you have to place yourself in, in an up-and-up only ledger, a centralized ledger where the much different merchants can underwrite. At the same time, they can see what's happening with the next customer across different uh, uh, merchants in the ecosystem and how is his behavior with simple and other payment methods. Uh, so this acts as a very key understanding for us to know his purchase graph patterns and also uh, then eventually go to social, like plot him on different social graphs and see where can we give him more and more limits and how we can uh, uh, extend more benefits to the user, okay? The last one is risk management. As I said, this credit involved in this entire piece, uh, fraud and credit risk management plays a very important part. Uh, when I say fraud, these are systemic frauds, uh, typically not happening from a credit fraudulent behavior, but more towards gaming the system or trying to understand how most users actually are being underwritten by these pay later companies and then try and come up with new different ways, uh, uh, which, is, which is very different from credit card fraud because eventually uh, people are wary that they would want to uh, take a loan someday, right? Uh, in pay later companies, it, it sort of becomes that these are very small transactions. Uh, you might miss making a payment. So the demarcation between a real fraudulent behavior and a non-payment or an NPA is, is very different. So what we typically do is we do not have, uh, we have zero tolerance about uh, of systemic fraud, but at the same time, we, we only give you credit limits on affinity. Let's say uh, there are about 11,000 odd merchants where Simple is really active on, but your affinity is only towards five or 10 merchants, okay? Now, how do we define affinity? It's, it's part of the, the centralized ledger wherein we have received data from uh, these merchants and at the same time the transactions uh, how you have behaved, right? So we would only give you uh, limits on those specific merchants. And we know that because you have affinity towards these merchants, uh, you have a real need rather than a one-time for lend behavior, right? And and with simple your phone number, your your the phone which you really use acts as the key key identity layer. But at the same time, that identity is matched with different other layers, especially with different merchants and other payment methods you would have used. Okay, so this becomes one of the key risk management factors for us to play out. Uh, the second one is capital liquidity. Now, since you're giving decent amount of credits on a on a daily use case behavior, all right, capital liquidity becomes a, a key challenge because this is not like a typical lending. Uh, in a typical lending, what usually happens is, let's say, a mortgage loan or or a car loan. Your principal is highest on day one. Okay, let's say you 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 bought a new house, you you taken a loan about for like fifty lakhs, right? Your principal would keep on depreciating because you you're going to eventually pay your EMIs, which is very different when it comes to consumers or non-discretionary consumer purchase or discretionary lending, uh, especially because your graph keeps on increasing as and in when you have access towards more merchants. Uh, you move from non-discretionary spending to discretionary spending on pay-later models, uh, the, 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 the velocity of the money increases. And eventually, you would, we would want to give you access to all the merchant base we have, but at the same time, manage that risk, right? Let's say I start you with like 10,000 rupees limit, and a year later, you would have spent over 1.2 lakhs of the year, but at the same time, you would not be at 10,000 rupees limit, you'd be at 25,000, 30,000 rupees limit. And that is the time... Uh, if you default, you're gonna lose me the maximum amount of money, right? So, so having to make sure that asset liability management around this, but at the same time, having the right sources of capital and have that liquidity and basically match the credit risk models uh, with the access to capital it becomes a really key factor for pay later companies. And one of the key things which, which we really tried to do is we want to like position ourselves as a, as a tab for the merchant, okay? And from the merchant to the consumers. Uh, that's where the regulatory piece comes in. What we have done is 
we usually do not fund these transactions using our own balance sheet. We give these insights and data to the merchants and then extend a line from the merchant to the consumers, right? There might be gaps in between different merchants have different behavior uh, and, and different unit economic models. So, so, so like, a, like an e-commerce merchant who has margins north of 30, 40% would be willing to give us a T plus 15 or T plus 30 model. Uh, whereas a grocery merchant would want to have his money back in T plus five because he has commitments to make. So this becomes a very key play, key part in our in our ecosystem, especially because as I said, we are building a two-sided marketplace, one for the merchants where you really need to understand the merchants need, serve their best customers, and the same side, when we acquire their customers, also help these consumers get the best out of them, right? Uh, that's one. So moving to the next one. What is, what is our core business model and how do we really make money and simple, right? So I think it's very, very, uh, very simplistic way of understanding that if you are serving a two-sided marketplace, there are only two people whom you can charge money at this point in time. And we usually have a flat MDR fee, the sort of merchant fees for about 1.8%, okay? Which is typically lower or at par with credit cards. Uh, and then, then we charge a 90 bips consumer fee, which acts basically as a deterrent for consumers to pay on time. Uh, it is usually not being triggered or used as a as a uh, defaulting method. Uh, it's more towards basically acting as a deterrent for these consumers who have been delaying their uh, bills with simple, right? So let me let me take you uh, on a deeper dive on our business model. Okay. So these are unit economics, as I explained, the two types of uh, revenues we make, which is uh, MDR, merchant discount rate, uh, which we apply on the total bill you have transacted with the, with the merchant, and then a user fee. Uh, but at the same time, when you talk about cost, even though we, we figure out the best underwriting models and the fraud models, there will be some credit losses at some point. Okay. Today, today typically pay later business models usually have uh, different kind of credit losses depending upon which sort of merchants you are uh, serving and which sort of consumer cohorts you are actually working with. So our credit losses tend to be the lowest because we only we do only targeted pay later modeling, wherein uh, credit losses do not have to play the biggest part because if you have built trust and that affinity towards the merchant, when you do affinity based underwriting, your credit losses would eventually be the lowest. But at times, especially during COVID, we have seen our credit losses not ballooning up to that extent compared to our, our competitors. But at the same time, there are instances wherein people have asked for extension. We kind of take that as a credit loss, give that feedback to the consumers and eventually roll them over, right? The second biggest cost, uh, which is towards the funding cost, as I said, that typically uh, you would have to pay the merchant in between a bill is due for a user and when the merchant really needs money. So we also use merchants money and also borrow money externally to uh, to basically fund this gap in between sort of called as a supply chain financing. And then the biggest cost is your collection or processing cost, transaction processing costs. They're typically usually uh, users would pay using their UPI handles or credit cards, debit cards. We do not really restrict them in terms of the mode of repayment, uh, but but this, this seems to be the, the industry standard in terms of the average cost. So, so if you look at this, right, it's a very thin margin business of about 1.5%. But one thing which is very key here is that this 1.5% is not over a period of one year. It depends upon the kind of uh, model you have, right? And imagine the existing simple model is for 15 days charge card, okay? where an average duration of a user transacting is about eight days, okay? So imagine if you're gonna make one rupee 45 pesa uh, in eight days for a hundred rupee transaction, now that can be rolled out to 52 weeks. So you basically going to make a lot of money, but at the same time also have to manage these different costs. Uh, so as I said, uh, that the credit losses usually balloon up if you go higher up the curve. Uh, this is typical to consumer lending, but at the same time, the margins tend to be good enough that eventually uh, these MDR rates are going to go down, especially for the merchants, because uh, because of the push regulatory. At the same time, the merchants really want uh, the best customers, want to have the best experience. At the same time, 
there's a there's a there's a need for a pay later product from the merchants which is why they're paying a slightly bit or on par premium with credit cards but i personally feel that the margins from the merchant side is going to be uh i think less than one percent in the next one one and a half years so this is what our our unit economics model look like today okay let me explain to you about different pay later companies across the globe and what they are doing okay so it's it's very different in different countries but as i started early on and i explained to you that uh, uh millennials behave in a similar fashion across the globe and the the similar fashion behavior and uh more credit risk averse users want to go towards either installment methods or pay later methods right uh, what users don't want to do is have credit cards with them and then smoothen their discretionary or non-discretionary purchases using credit card debt uh, which is what happened during the financial crisis and and all the pay-later companies were really able to position themselves and scale only after uh, most consumers learned this behavior right um, one of the key things which visa mentioned uh, was uh, global installment payments okay this is 2017 have been growing at a rate of 15 percent year year on year right and and the total volume of these transactions have gone north of 1.2 trillion dollars right and this is growing rapidly given given that the use cases of consumer lending from credit card debt has moved to more towards pay later products or installments right i'll give you a very quick example about afterpay right um, afterpay is a company which was started in 2016 in australia uh, and it is one of those small markets, but very niche markets with a decent amount of competition of millennials over there. What they were clearly uh, trying to do is rather than having a credit card on checkout, they would usually use your own bank account, okay? Underwrite you, basis your behavior on different merchants, okay? And then give you an installment based credit product, which is typically known in India as a zero cost EMI product, okay? Uh, typically, these zero-cost email products are actually not zero-cost for the consumer. It's actually the consumer who pays for it. Cost is blended in the, co uh, in the, in the cost of the product, right? Uh, similar to Afterpay, Klarna wanted to do this, but for a very niche consumer set where they were only going for uh, high-ticket purchases, okay? Maybe your 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 vacation to, to a one-month vacation to Europe or Asia, uh, your purchases of Louis Vuitton bags. So they were focusing themselves on a very niche market, but both these companies have really been able to position themselves uh, on like north of $5 billion market caps very quickly, right? Uh, so, and then you have Affirm. Affirm is a startup uh, brought in by Max Levchin, ex-co-founder of uh, uh, PayPal. Uh, what Affirm is specifically trying to do in US is bring that affordability factor of credit card uh, cards into your daily purchases as well as your one time purchases on on uh, non high frequency but your uh, 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 more towards your affordability and more towards your aspirational product purchases right uh, what we are trying to do at simple is not go towards your aspirational purchases first help you on your day to day transaction help you so solve that budgeting needs and at the same time learn more about these consumers and build a trust your trust with these merchants and then eventually offer you these sort of services uh, i personally feel that pay later market installments are going to be a huge market uh, in the next few years one indian company who's actually done well on the consumer lending side is bajaj finance but it's they have a very different mindset or a very different business approach to solving this problem uh, and given that the lowest credit card penetration in India, India seems to be one of the biggest opportunities to work on pay later installment products. So that's pretty much about what I want to talk about today. I'm happy to take any questions if you guys have uh, for me. Thanks, sir. Thank you so much, Nitin. I think it was phenomenal. Really great insights and uh, really practical experience coming through. And I think all of us really gained. And um, yeah, I, we open up to questions now. So, guys, please send in your questions. There are a few already that have come in, so I'll start with those while we basically get in some more. Uh, and um, the first set, there are a few with, with a common theme around the current situation we're in, in terms of COVID. Uh, um, and uh, are you seeing any changes in terms of consumer behavior? So, I, I guess both sides of the story. One is changes in terms of consumer behavior from a, from a consumption perspective. 
and two also in in terms of impacting your unit economics from say a collections or credit risk standpoint uh, any any thoughts on that that's a pretty good question and, and this is the most common question asked by everybody around so let me let me basically tackle this in two different ways right uh, so something like this happened a couple of years back, especially with demonetization, where there's a large shift from cash-based payments to wallet-based payments, right? With, with the impact of COVID has been very harsh on different businesses, especially these businesses revolving around shared economy, like let's say quick ride, uh, bounce, when you're gonna use uh, other products, uh, especially something which is used by somebody else. Uh, but where simple comes or paleto businesses are happening, right? there's a huge push towards digitization of transactions, okay? And which digitization of transactions, fintech seem to be the most prominent hit there. And nobody wants to deal with cash, especially merchants. Uh, as I said, right, uh, I don't know if you guys order on Big Basket or Grofers, imagine during the entire lockdown, Big Basket was hit with the highest per day orders they would have done in a week's time, right? And you were always constantly facing problems with slot times so you're not basically able to get the slots for your order to be accepted and delivered right the only way you could do without having too many clicks is either a pay later model or a cash delivery model now given the covid happening a lot of people and especially a lot of merchants are going towards a cashless model right uh, so if you want to have the similar experience of cash and delivery the only way you can do with the lowest amount of cash bags or charge bags would, would be a pay later model because the merchant would then assume that simple would have done the basic underwriting, gone through that entire hardship process, and then figured out that the consumer would eventually value that, that one click checkout experience without even worrying about the money because he would have already made a purchasing decision. So imagine you want to add things to your cart, right? Whenever you're adding things to your cart, you already made that decision. Uh, and then the last leg is where the biggest pain for these sort of merchants came. So what we saw, especially with grocery merchants there's been a massive push they've grown by 10x and we have been uh, the best benefactors of this uh, entire move and and if you if you were to like uh, imagine a situation uh, where what happened to paypal uh, when ebay was actually uh, starting or doing really well is the only way paypal became really successful was ebay was able to grow their user base but at the same time help the consumers or the buyer and seller solve that problem with intention uh, or, or, or eBay basically acting as a mediator and solving for the fraud or cash uh, situation. So they basically would act like an escrow. Uh, simple sort of comes in that place when, when you talk to the merchants, but from a consumer point of view, they, they more are, they're more focused towards the experience and the one click checkout. Uh, I think we're in the right spot, to be honest. And, and the impact of COVID has been more positive to us than negative. Uh, in fact, uh, a lot of change or the consumer behavior uh, change uh, in the last couple of months we have seen, uh, which was not even happened over the last entire year. Okay, uh, and, and a lot of people now are, are even talking to us and, and consumers basically are saying, can you give me higher and higher credit limits, but at the same time also help me have the similar experience on offline merchants as well. We're still trying to figure out how we could do that best. But at the same time, uh, I think I think because of the entire COVID situation, all the fintechs are going to benefit a lot, uh, be it financial services or insurance companies. Th this is going to be a massive boost for these companies. Thanks, no, that's really interesting. And um, so in, in terms of uh, the kind of consumers that you guys have been targeting and have so far, like you had mentioned earlier, uh, given the lack of credit card access, uh, a lot of your users say thin file, uh, new to credit customers and if so how do you build that credit history so do you take like a bit of a punt to begin with to give them a low and growth strategy on your credit lines how, how does it work very, very good question in fact um so the way you build a thin file data right so imagine uh, so uh, think about this right typically in us um a, a typical student there would start his credit journey with a student loan right uh, and then he would get his first job start paying those emis start taking the phone, utility bills, and all of that stuff. So that does not happen in India. Most students are being funded by their parents or, or eventually manage their own money and fund their education, right? So the new to credit customers are the most difficult customers. But at the same time, these new to credit customers have been doing transactions on their mobile. 
and and they are the they are the early adopters in the entire mobile e-commerce space so what we try and do not take a punt definitely we try and understand their behavior with these merchants which is why i said building that large massive merchant network is the key to have that credit engine really running and the underwriting models and the fraud models to prevent their behavior uh, especially i'll give an example especially with students when they're new to credit they tend to think this is some sort of a student loan uh, typically it is not you are basically giving passive information to the market uh, about your behavior today and how you're going to behave in the future given that if you're if you're given the best services in the market right uh, and uh, what we do i think is quite proprietary there wherein uh, you have to build a, a large merchant network but at the same time act as a cooperative with these merchants and eventually what we also want to do is the consumers can give their information as well if they want to right uh, if that, that's how typically you can get the consumers also engaging in this data sharing model. Um, and the entire idea there is going to be basically if a thin file consumer, when compared to a bureau data, acts differently. And what we have seen historically that most Indian consumers do not want credit card or don't feel the need of having credit card. They would rather want to do it with a debit card or cash on delivery or now uh, UPI, right? Uh, so the only way to solve for this is understand their behavior, what they have done in the past, and how they're going to present themselves in the future. So that's that's going to be the key, I guess, and having that data sharing across these merchants and from the consumers and looking at the pattern uh, is is what is going to drive this further and further. Not so that's why I said right. We we want to play more towards the convenience credit and not go towards the affordability credit side of the business. Thanks. Uh, just just a quick time check. I know we're past four, uh, and uh, I think if it's if it's okay with everybody, we'll probably extend this for another ten minutes because I think there's some really interesting questions coming in, and Nitin, uh, really great insights. So we, uh, if it's okay with everybody, we'll, we'll extend. Uh, Nitin, to, to continuing on the point you just mentioned, and there are a few questions here around data. Uh, so one is you also you already mentioned how um, through your model you get access to a lot of rich consumption data and are able to help merchants as well as. Uh, improve your underwriting processes. So one question is, A, do you guys use credit bureau data? B, another question is around the lines of data sharing and privacy. So uh, we, our last research session was actually with Samuthi on the whole account identity framework to try and you know make sure uh, data protection and data sharing are both balanced. So uh, like, what is your model in that sense? How do you guys manage that, that piece? Of it? Uh, okay, so in terms of data, data privacy and how we have built uh, the, the model around it is we definitely take consent from the users on using their consumer behavior or their purchase history and transaction data. And, and all of that is done after user agreement. Okay, and this is a data which is shared between the merchant uh, and simple and, and is in a very close loop network. At the same time, we are not sharing this information with third party or not even using for lending purposes or publishing this information outside. What that does is basically it gives you specific signals about your purchases and feeds into your uh, credit scoring or, or underwriting or trust behavior model. Um, now, when you ask me if we do use Bureau data, we have not used Bureau data. And we personally feel the Bureau data is quite outdated because as I said, unless you've really built your credit history with banks, who would be the last mile uh, for you to go and uh, take a uh, lending like a personal loan or a, or a vehicle loan and some of those things. Uh, we do not usually go there and we, we have never actually taken any bureau data. But what we have seen when compared with bureau data and simple trust score, simple trust score stands out because, because there the, the user's real true value come in. Uh, if you're taking bureau data, you, the consumer has actually taken a loan to smoothen his curve, right? Let, let's imagine this, right? You, you want, you, let's say you make 50,000 rupees a month you want to take a bike for about a lakh. You can save up two months of your salary and buy a bike. Or what you could do is, is basically take a bike on a loan, smoothen your curve by basically saying that I'm going to pay it over the next 10 months, right? Now that is very different behavior than you basically buying your food on a daily basis. You're going to eventually buy food, whether it's simple, your cash, or, or you're going to use your bank account. So we try and help for the convenience part of it. And the data acts as one of the key factors in trying to understand the customer and actually help the customer be served better by these merchants. 
Thanks. Um, another set of questions are around, and you covered some of these uh, related to COVID, but I think there are a few more questions just to cover as well. From a uh, COVID impact credit risk side of the, so I think like you mentioned, from a consumption perspective, you've definitely seen an uptick, uh, and there are a lot of opportunities for you. Uh, from a credit risk standpoint, and uh, so uh, just just looking at that aspect of it, a couple of questions. So one is um, along the lines of say your limit strategy, where I think you also mentioned that you do like a low and growth strategy where you increase the limit over time based on consumption behavior, uh, and you have analytical models to track that to see how that consumption pattern is moving. Uh, are you seeing under COVID, would you feel like the old behavior that you've been using to build your models, would that still be valid? So are you guys looking at uh, having to temporarily look at maybe freezing limits or reducing limits? How, how are you guys managing that? That's question one. Uh, question two is uh, on the other side of the credit side, which is the collection side, uh, do you guys have any, um, like how do you get repayments from customers? Uh, do you all use say, Direct debits, ECSs. How does that work? Or do you have any strategies there to to manage your credit risk on that end? Sure, sure. Um, so, so the way. So, okay, let's talk about the limit management in terms of what we are doing uh, post COVID. Uh, in in fact, consumer behavior on especially on these trusted set of consumers have actually shown more trust in terms of how they purchase. And there's been a lot of network activation. When I say network activation. Uh, Let's say when I did a loan growth strategy, for the first time I saw you transacting on Zomato, much of those places, and you were you had a very good affinity towards Zomato, right? But eventually, because of this COVID, a lot of different businesses became really relevant to you, uh, like Dunzo, Big Basket, Grofers, and these guys, right? And suddenly I saw a new set of behavior from you, okay, on these merchants. Now I could I could either stop you from transacting there completely. But my entire business model is built on that. If you have shown a certain behavior with what accuracy can I predict your behavior on the next set of merchants, depending upon the kind of purchases, right? And these are daily essentials you're talking about, which is what I keep on stressing that if you are going to solve for affordability, that's going to be a one-time purchase in a period of one year, two year, three years, right? But when you're solving for daily use cases, limits really do not become a problem. It, it is more towards uh, a cat and mouse game, the more you would want to the user to spend, but at the same time, you would want to underwrite him better. And your underwriting is based on his behavior with you, his repayment behavior with you, and the behavior he has had with merchants. So which is why the whole uh, ledger comes into play, right? You, you're able to see a three-dimensional ledger of, or, of his transactions and the way he has done uh, his consumer behavior across his merchants and simple. And then the second question which you had was about repayments. Uh, we have different modes of repayments other than cash. Uh, definitely auto debit is one of them that also acts as one of the key factors in, in also underwriting a user, basically try and see whether that trust score between now, between simple and the consumer is built or not. Okay. Now, if you are trusting us with an eNash or an ECS or, or an auto, auto debit on your credit card, right, that sort of acts as another uh, evidence basically that the consumer is basically a convenient user rather than a credit averse user and we typically tend to go towards those set of users and so far we haven't seen any specific ask or changes due to COVID. and most of these people are usually buying essentials so unlike the moratorium extended by rbi or banks on your large loans it really have not impacted us at all well, thanks. I think it's really interesting. Uh, I, I, unfortunately, I, I think we could keep going on, but unfortunately, we are very, very short of time. I'll, I'll ask one last question sure, uh, sure. more along the lines of career opportunities and skill sets, uh, which is also another aspect that Uday looks at. So the question is, uh, again, twofold. One is, any suggestions on some key skills that, uh, that students should look to develop or should have when they're pursuing such careers, uh, be it in the pay later space or uh, maybe from a larger perspective, when what what does simple look at in that sense, um, and and B in terms of uh, like what what is your what is your take on the next couple of years given the current situation, uh, what are the opportunities ahead for for students? So I, I so I, let me let me answer this with a little bit of history, right? Uh, FinTech innovation has not been happening for the last ten years. It's been happening for the past two hundred years or a hundred years, especially right from the time when Diners Club started their first credit card to what banks, Wells Fargo and these guys did in 1800s, and especially uh, banks were built as tools for trust when you park your money, but at the same time also help you uh, serve your credit needs. 
Um, and some of the skills which, which you really need to be uh, very successful in fintech companies uh, would be uh, one, a very clear openness about change in status quo, right? The, so one quadrant which really comes to my mind is there are different set of financial services companies trying to serve different needs, right? If you think about a quadrant uh, across four corners and x-axis, y-axis, one of the quadrants basically talks about greed and fear, right? Uh, so typically in investment products serve towards your greed, okay? The, way, the, the reason why I say that is because you are, you're going to buy an investment product not because it has the best user experience or not because it, it would help me something else. You want the best financial gain out of that investment product because that there's a greed there. But at the same time, when you have the most fear and you want to secure that financial fear, you would go and buy insurance, okay? Uh, so if you think similar ways, now what sort of skill sets do you need? You definitely need to think first principles in terms of understanding what are you really solving for the consumer and then how can you build a business model around it? Uh, at Simple, what we really look for is very deep technical expertise in, in understanding the different facets of business, especially in terms of financial products uh, and a very deep understanding on data. And I personally believe that in India, we have not even started this journey in terms of uh, innovation, especially, right? Uh, I think in the next 10 to 15 years, uh, there's going to be a massive change in how financial services or financial services are being rendered. There's a lot of regulatory change happening. So in terms of upscaling, there's a lot of ways you could do. Uh, you could want to be a product manager. For you to be a product manager, you need to understand different facets of a business, try and build those first principle products. Uh, but at the same time, if you want to, uh, explore a career in sales and marketing. It's a very different sk skill set or, or very different niche when you compare yourself with selling uh, a soap for Unilever, right? Uh, so, so I, I think uh, if you if you really want to go deeper in fintech, you first really need to understand the history of how these things have happened, why they have happened, and then distill down to your first principles and whether they match with your first principles and whether you would want to think in those lines. That's the only way you could actually do it. And the, the real beauty is if your first principles align with what the fintech really wants to do, that's when that agile nature of the fintech uh, or a fintech company comes into you and you would want to basically make that as a personal goal to help uh, uh, the end consumer see what you really want to put here. That, that's, my, that's my take on this. Thanks, Rathan. Thank you so much. I think it's really helpful as well for the folks on the call to understand how, like, what, what they need to focus on uh, in terms of excelling in this. And I think you hit the nail in terms of that innovation and like ability to change and see patterns is what what is important. Um, but but yeah, th thank you so much again, Nathan. Uh, I think it's been a really good session. Um, really, also really like the the practical side of things in terms of the perspective you provided uh, and the different strategies. That Simple is looked at beyond. You know, a simple pay data and the other key aspects in terms of merchant uh, management, insights, analytics, all of it. It was, it was really interesting to hear your perspective. So thank you so much for coming today. Um, Thanks, and, Thanks for coming. Yep. Yeah, and thank thank you to the students who who attended and for the really good questions we had. I think that's testament to the 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 subject matter that we had today. Uh, and we hope you found this session useful. As you can see on the screen, we put our our email address. So please do write in, send in your suggestions. I think we've got a few suggestions from the poll we shared on the group today, as well as in from emails that open banking and digital banking are two areas that you all are interested in. So we are looking at setting up uh, such sessions in the next couple of weeks. But do definitely write in, provide your feedback on the format. Uh, if you have any questions that you want us to pass on, we can do that as well. Uh, and any other topics you want to look at, happy to look at that as well. Uh, but from all of us at the other session, thank you so much and, and have a good uh, week. Bye bye.